The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup ran it over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Johnny's Bite. It's Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, you know, I like to touch on issues that really touch the nerve of the nation. Because Wednesday is my day of birth and same as the president who leads all of us. So we like to talk about things that are central to the development of the country called Ghana. This morning, we are told that transport fares will go down by 10, uh, 10% or so. That's good news. And the drivers are also demanding that, well, if their transport fares are going down because everybody says everything is dependent on transport, then other commodities need to go down as well. But this morning, I also want to remind you that the government of the Republic of Ghana and the presidency have not given you the response from Al Jazeera on the gold mafia. I also want to remind you that the children are being starved in the schools because school feeding caterers are on strike. It tells you where as a nation we put our priorities. We we'll come and scream and shout and say we are fighting corruption and everything. Then when allegations of corruption are made against that, the responses are put out there, we send people to come and correct English with English. So Al Jazeera response is not out there. And the school feeding children are also home. But on Monday, former President John Dramani Mahama, who is the NDC's latest flag bearer, flag bearer elect, made a certain comment about the collapsed banks or the banking sector cleanup, as the government likes to call it. So there's a, a, already a division of ideas. One party says it is collapsed banks. The other one says it is the cleanup of the banking sector. And there have been the blame game that Pontin Tokwa has been going on and on. But he said something. He said that he will give back the licenses of those banks that were... Um, unjustifiably closed or shut down. Listen to him. We will restore indigenous Ghanaian investment in the financing and banking sector. And we will create a tiered banking system that will serve various segments of the market. We will give the opportunity for experienced banking hands who were laid off and needlessly to secure their careers once more and move away from the menial jobs that they were compelled to take. Chinese as far as practicable, Chinese the banking licenses that were unjustly cancelled by this government will be restored. Our nation is still at the crossroads with crippling debts and an inefficient and wasteful government. Chinese we cannot continue this pathway. It is a betrayal of our people. We cannot continue this pathway. It's a betrayal of our people. So you heard him. The first question that came to mind when I heard this was, why is the former president choosing to talk about this at this particular time? That's the first question. Question number two. I thought that licenses for banks were issued by the Bank of Ghana and that the Bank of Ghana is supposed to be independent. So is the former president suggesting to us that Government have had great influence on the Bank of Ghana and still we have been presented with the image of the Bank of Ghana as being independent. I'm, I'm only asking my questions. But then he made an instructive point that banks that were unjustifiably shut down. It raises the question as to the process, the motive, the characters of the individuals behind the collapse or if you like the cleanup and then the action itself which boils down to ethics, the character, the action, the motive, and the consequence. He spoke about it. Now, if it was done in the way that it shouldn't have been done, because we already told, originally told about some 9 billion that we're going to use to do the cleanup, we ended up spending over 20 billion. So that's like 200% more what we said we were going to use. And in any very simple terms, can that qualify as causing financial loss to the state? And if we are asking questions of causing financial loss to the state, who supervised it? The finance ministry, led by Mr. Keno Foriata, deputized, or if you like, uh, um, with a state minister, or minister of state, Dr. Charles Edubahin, 
Can we hold them and hold their feet to the fire for supervising such thing? And you see, the government has been so clever in trying to tell us that, oh, we protected depositors' funds. We protect the depositors' funds. You remember that when the banking sector clean up or collapse, I, now I'm confused as to what exactly means, whether clean up or collapse. But when it happened, we were told about bonds, that people were going to be giving zero-coupon zero bonds. And somebody asked that if I am going to the market or I send my wife to the market to go and buy me something, have my money stuck at the bank, I, I, I will go and tell the market woman that give me tomatoes because government has given me bonds. So collect my bonds and give me tomatoes. And at some point, even those monies that were supposed to have been saved, people could not go beyond a certain threshold of their own monies. I think about 50000 or so. So we actually put people through a lot of hardship. People, people claim that others have died because of this. President Mahama said people are doing menial jobs because of this. So who do we really hold responsible? Do we hold Mr. Ken Oforiata, the finance minister, responsible? Do we hold Mr. Charles Edubwain responsible? Do we hold Abuna Asari, deputy finance minister, responsible? We need to be asking these questions. At the time when this happened, the people who were there, do we hold them responsible? Do we hold the governor of Bank of Ghana, Dr. Addison, do we hold him responsible for causing financial loss to the state in this matter? Because it, if it was unjustifiably done, is President Muhammad giving us a signal that he will hold their feet to the fire? The deputy governors of the Bank of Ghana, do we hold them responsible? Now, did you know that there is a, a man in charge of banking supervision? There's a whole office in charge of banking supervision at the Bank of Ghana. And they go to the banks on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, on a half-year basis, on an annual basis, and they go there and they are giving reports upon reports. In 2022, we're learning that banks are not feeling too well. And Joe Jackson has been talking about it that, look, it is because of the domestic debt exchange program, again brought upon us by reckless economic management and also under the supervision of Mr. Ken Ophiriata. So we cleaned up the banks. One of the banks that was hardly hit is the Consolidated Bank Ghana, within which UT Bank, uh, all the other banks that were collapsed, Capital Bank, uh, uh, all of them were put together. Royal Bank, Heritage Bank, they were all put together as Consolidated Bank Ghana. They were the hardest hit in 2022, according to the report that was published. So the question we ask is, these individuals have mentioned, shouldn't we be holding their feet to the fire for causing financial loss to the state, for at least supervising this, and that if they are not guilty? Because we hear some of the harrowing stories. Captain, uh, uh, Captain uh, Prince Kofi Amu had been retired. He had a conversation with us, and he mentioned in that conversation that he had even brought in investors to come and take over UT Bank. The Bank of Ghana wrote to the investor to tell them that they were not interested in the offer without even informing them. Listen, them, listen, them, listen, them, listen. The other things that we're doing, corporate responsibility and all those things, all these things are going to go away. And one thing that I don't understand, here's a government that says, I'm coming to create jobs. And you take actions to actually send people home before you create the, uh, jobs. I don't get it because I think the sensible thing is to see how you can contain as much as possible part of what you, is already created and add to it. But the unintended consequences would have been far more, you know, disastrous than what we saw. This is the most disastrous uh, uh, approach they, they, they adopted. Because we owe the government 800 million. The closure of UT Bank cost this country at least 2.2 billion. Now, we had an investor who says, I want to take over UT. And he actually put down money's token to show that they are interested in it. And the first of all was, we'll pay 400 of the 800 and Bank of Ghana write off the 400. Now, we're even negotiating with them to say that we'll pay the 800, but give us more time to pay the 800, and then we'll take over the bank. The interesting and funny thing is that Bank of Ghana, behind us, wrote to our investor to tell the investor one week to the closure that they didn't like their offer. That's not Bank of Ghana's investors. They have no relationship with them. 
and they did not even copy us. And the investor felt, oh, since he's been written to, we must know. So it's as if some plan was hatched to spring a surprise and to just... Do you believe that some plan was hatched? I'm, I don't have time to think about those things. I don't mm -hmm. bear guys. What has happened has happened. You mm -hmm. see, one thing is, this country is more important than UT or any other company. And he puts it succinctly, this country is more important. But you see the, how the machinations were done. So I'm asking again, should people's feet be held to the fire? Because if you say I have a problem that is worth X amount, and for which reason you are shutting me down, because majority of the banks, beyond those that were already rotten, majority of the banks were just, it was just a matter of minimum capital requirement of 400 million that they do not have. A minimum capital requirement of 400 million that they do not have. Now, that minimum capital requirement and what we spent in the name of trying to clean up the place could have actually come to top up for all of them and then you do proper supervision and strengthen them, you'd have saved jobs, you'd have saved the depositors, you'd have saved people the, the recklessness and the heartbreak, the BP and the diabetes and all the other conditions that people are managing and people not being able to even assess their monies. So we should be looking at Mr. Furiata. We should be looking at Mr. Charles Dubuahin. We should be looking at the governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Addison. We should be looking at his deputies. We should be looking at all the other people, head of banking supervision, everybody, and ask ourselves whether they are candidates for causing financial loss to the state. Now, yesterday, the Gihok, Gihok, Gihok at industrial area, there was heavy police presence at Gihok. At least 20 policemen at Gihok. What were they there to do? They were there to prevent the staff of Gihok from demonstrating. And I will serialize this in the next two, three days. I have documents. So don't bother covering up because we already have the documents. Gihok. Now, what were they, what were they protesting? They were protesting the fact that the MD for Gihok had returned, the Honorable Maxwell Kofi Juma, in law of the president. Because if you didn't know, Mr. Maxwell Kofi Juma, beyond what he said that President Kufado can never be president of this country, he had also given his son out to marry the president's daughter. So he's the president's in law. Give or take the, the president's in law. And so give or take is a family and friends thing. But I don't want to get into those personal issues. Mr. Maxwell Kofi Juma was born in 1950, June. So next month, he will be 73. He's older than Ghana. He is the boss or MD of Gihok. The staff were protesting because he had returned after about two months of a sick leave. And they say that the dissolution of the, inter, uh, 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 what the IMC, the management team that was put in place in his absence was dissolved. And listen, it always comes, they say, order from above. Who exactly is that order from above? Today, I'll tell you how much we spend on the boss of, of Gihok. Now, this is, please enlarge it for me. This is a document that we chanced upon or that we intercepted, okay? This document is on the conditions of service. Uh, it is dated the 1st of August. 1st of August. It's quite blurred there, so you can see. 2019 or so. Honorable Maswa Kofi Juma, Managing Director, Gihok Distilleries, Company Limited, DSA. Revision of conditions of service of the Managing Director. Following successful conclusions with the brand, board, or stakeholders regarding your salary review, da 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 First one, proposed basic salary, and, and I can tell you that it's any over 50,000. Proposed basic salary, 50,417 Ghana cities and two pesos. Basic salary, 50,417 Ghana cities, two pesos. Free accommodation rented by the company with soft furnishing. A, in the absence of the accommodation, or free accommodation by the company, the managing director will be given a lump sum payment for one year rent in advance at a monthly rent of 
13,500 uh, Ghana cities. So a total for the full year will be 162,000 Ghana cities. Now, should the company provide the accommodation, the managing director will be allowed to buy movable household items such as furniture, mattress, fridge, etc., etc., as approved by the board. Entertainment allowance, 10% of basic salary. Utility benefits, 10% of basic salary. Clothing allowances, 10% of basic salary. Driver shall be put on the company's payroll. This is what the benefits are for the boss, the managing director of Gihok. So very well paid, very well taken care of. But I will stop here because there are other two or three letters that I wanted to show you. But I'll stop here because I'm told that my time is up. So I'll stop here. Tomorrow, I will show you how the Ghana Revenue Authority has taken over the account of, of Gihok because when in 2019 or before 2019, Georg was getting awards for being very tax efficient and compliant, they are now being dragged by the Ghana Revenue Authority. They are before the courts with SNIT for not paying SNIT benefits. And SNIT has asked that the matter be ended by, and the courts have directed that the matter be ended by uh, 20th of May. And then I'll show you one from Metropolitan Insurance, where tier three benefits of these workers of Gayhawk have not been paid since January 2022. And then I will show you other documents that no media house in this country has. I'll share with you tomorrow. So please, tomorrow, make a date with us. I've just showed you how Mr. Kofi Juma is 73 in June, how he's an in-law of the president, how police were brought in to prevent the staff of Gayhawk from protesting that their salaries, even for March, have not been paid, I think or April rather, have not been paid, and they fear that the salaries for May may not be paid, how they have their SNIT benefits are in limbo, how their tier three are in limbo, and how their taxes have become a problem. I also show you vehicles of how some of the suppliers are not happy and they came to move their things. Question that we ask is, this is a state-owned enterprise set up in 1958 it has declared profitability in the past if they are not able to pay salaries they are not able to honor tier three they are not able to pay snit they are not able to pay all those things it tells you that all is not well like abf Hussein will say when you see somebody selling his pregnant goat at the market center it tells you there are pregnant problems at home but the president chooses to keep retirees at post while the young cry. So, the president's in-law, I mentioned it to you. Tomorrow, I'll give you some more juice. Good morning.